Great. And then let me just grab the chat window and move that to where I need it. Perfect. Okay. So as you can see, the title of, of my presentation is Improving Your, your DAC Skills uh, and the subtitle with DAX.do. So I'm going to explain to you more what DAX.do is and how you could go ahead and use it. Uh, we'll skip over this slide pretty quickly, right? It was just a, a short introduction. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter if you want to uh, hit me there at uh, Kev Arnold. Uh, so I always welcome conversation there. Uh, this is what my uh, my social profile looks like, um, and you could see in my regular picture why I wear a hat all the time. So, <laughs> okay. So a couple of slides to just kind of introduce DAX.do. So DAX.do is brought to us by um, the the Italian guys at uh, SQL BI, uh, Marco and Alberto. Uh, you know, they give us a lot of good resources. Uh, I'll probably plug them a few times. Uh, I get nothing from them for it, except uh, all the same free education that we all seem to get by the articles, videos, the wonderful stuff that they put out there. This is just another one of those. It's a sandbox for practicing DAX queries. And the, the key word in, in that first bullet point is the word queries. So when we work with measures, right, which is typically what we do within Power BI, that is built to be a, a calculation that changes based upon what we're, what visual we're putting it on, what our filtering context is and everything. And that's where we first learn to write DAX. But the query is the actual statement that's running and using that measure and gives a lot of the context, gives all of the context to the measure that's being used. So it's pretty important to learn how to write DAX queries. So we're gonna run through DAX queries today using DAX.do. And um, as this, that bullet point says, you could kind of think of a DAX query like a SQL statement. It's gonna return a table and that's very important. So every visual that you have generates a DAX query. You could see it on performance man uh, manager or performance analyzer, sorry. Um, and, and you get to see what, what the queries look like. I encourage you to do that. It's helped me learn queries quite a bit by trying to go through what Power BI generates itself. Uh, paginated reports, especially with the PPU, the premium per user coming out, you're seeing a lot more movement on paginated reports. In fact, um, Guy in the Cube, the last two videos that he put out this week were around paginated reports. So that tells me that's picking up steam um, now that, that it can be built into um, on the service and everything. Uh, when you're doing tables, right, calculating tables, you may have seen people sharing a common uh, DAX query that's gonna generate like a date table or whatever, right? So there's another, another query and it's used to generate tables within your Power BI. So it's good to know how to write these queries. And then when you're learning um, through a lot of like the SQL BI books or their articles or whatever, they're putting the queries out there. So it's important to learn how to read them in order to, to learn some more. So those are just some of the examples that I, I kind of thought of. Um, and, and I'm sure there's, there's probably some more. All right, so let's, let's kind of take a look at um, a sample DAX query. And so this was from a, a Power BI data set that I used. Um, on the left-hand side is just a simple visual that I produced and I used the performance analyzer to go ahead and pull out that query. And, and this is what it looked through, looks like. Um, it looked like at that, that point in time. We're gonna use this as a template on DAX.do to try to see if we could deconstruct it. And we'll deconstruct it from this evaluate the bottom up and try to understand some more of what is being done all here inside here so that we can fully understand what the query looks like. All right, so let's go. If you use QR codes, let me grab um, the link to, I have a bunch of, uh, the exercises and other things that I use in one uh, setup called GitToby. And if you follow that link, uh, you could either work along with me or you could work uh, ahead of me. Or if you want to, if you 
don't get it from the chat, uh, tinyurl.com do lab will also get you there. So go ahead and open that up and then you can work right along with me because I know you're on some type of device, right? Since you're, you're hearing and working with me. All right, so we're gonna use, every, the x.do is just available in your standard web browser. I'm gonna start this, uh, this time within a private browser, but um, it doesn't have to be private. I'm doing this just for this very first um, window that comes up and I'll, I'll explain why here in just a second. All right, so it's simply you type the x.do and navigate there. And this is what it's gonna look like when it first comes up. It's got this wonderful video over here where Marco is explaining to us what it is. Uh, it has just you know a quick, quick summary here. This, you can collapse it. Um, and there was a way uh, here to bring it back if you ever wanna watch it. Um, I'm gonna cover pretty much the same things that Marco covers, but sometimes you might wanna hear it in, you know, with that Italian accent because everything is always better with an Italian accent and I'm not gonna be able to do that. Okay, so uh, let's kind of walk through a little bit. I wanna get back to my example here. Let's walk through a little bit. You can see it has, has multiple panes on it. So different areas that we're gonna walk through and they'll come uh, active as we start doing things here. You can see all the command lines are, are uh, disabled at this point. If you do happen to find a bug, you can use the report a bug feature. Um, I don't know where that, why that opened that up. I guess it opened up in a, uh, I'm not gonna keep up in this one. Uh, if you click on that and it opens in your browser, uh, you'll be able to, oh, I know why, because they changed it to, uh, if you look down at the very bottom, it shows that they're sending an email and so it was trying to hit something to send a default email. You could change your theme from light to dark. I tend to prefer dark. And there are some options that you could come in, uh, turning on word wrap, autocomplete, saving history. Um, you know, you can mess around with these if you want. I think I left all mine at the default, um, but it's there if you want it. So on this, starting on this left-hand side, what this is, is this is our data model. And then right below it is a little advertising box for them. And if you haven't looked at some of their classes, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, short lines for the win, thanks Ed. Um, so definitely look at some of their classes. One of the, the newer ones that they ha have out there, the mastering class, I think it is. I've heard wonderful things about it. So, um, but you can go ahead and get rid of that. So you can get more room down here. So when you're looking at your model, of course, the very first thing of being able to write good DAX is to have a good data model. And this is why I think it's so valuable that, that they, that um, SQL BI provides this to us because you know that the data models, and there are two, I'll show you the second one here in a second. You know, these models are going to be good models, right? Because that's what they do. So when you're sitting there trying to develop DAX queries, maybe against your model and you're struggling and you're wondering, you know, Am I doing DAX wrong? Is the model wrong? You're at least eliminating one of the things here. The, the restriction is, is that you could only use their models. Uh, so they're using their standard Contoso model. And they also have a second model for DAX.guide. Uh, it looks very much like Contoso, uh, but it has a couple of special things for what they put out at DAX.guide. And we'll talk more about DAX guide here in a little bit. So you could click on one of the tables and you could see down at the bottom, it's gonna tell you currency table and you got a Chevron here that you could expand it out a little bit more. Hopefully you guys, um, okay, yeah. Uh, Juan, I'm getting to the model diagram in just a second, but you might be a little bit ahead of, a, ahead of me. So doubt at this, this part, and it may be a little hard, a little small for you guys to read on your screen, right? But. Um, it when you expand it out, it tells you currency is a table. It tells you the DAX name, the number of rows. It's got 28. It's got three columns, and it considers it a dimension. You could also do that for a column to where it tells you here this is a column. 
the, what the name is, the fully qualified name with the table name in front of it. So this is currency currency. It shows you the minimum value. So you have an idea that this is text and a maximum value, US dollar. Um, distinct values is 28, and then the data type is, is string. So it's always important to know this as you're working with DAX and they, they give you a lot of good information to do this. Um, you could also click on the three dots and you could show um, hidden metrics. And then you're gonna see another column pops up. Well, this is their, their key column. And this is what, you know, if you made a column hidden in Power BI, this would hide from you as well. So this is the same thing as if Power BI, you were saying show hidden columns. And then you got this little icon here that's telling you it has a relationship. And if we expand the bottom out, we'll see we have all these, the same things we had before, but it also shows us what our relationship is. And we have a relationship sales currency uh, is on the many side and currency currency key is on the one side. So that's kind of good, right? We, we could kind of tell what the model is looking like, but what Juan kind of alluded to in the chat, there's, there's a little bit better way. They have a view diagram here. And if you click on that, that opens in another tab. And you can move these things around uh, and it's gonna remember it for you. Uh, and you could you know, highlight the relationships and see, you know. so this is a, a lot easier to read. They do also, I didn't grab the, the fact table before, you notice that has a yellow dot and it has the legend up here to the top right where it tells you that the yellow dots are fact tables and the blue dots are dimension tables. So, you know, this is, this is great. We could see there how there's three relationships uh, for date to due date, date to delivery date, and date to order date. And the date to order date is the one that's active. So if we're gonna use date, it's gonna be off of this. Okay, so what does DAX.guide or DAX guide model look like? And because I keep coming in private, I make this little change every single time. But if I went into one that wasn't private, it would remember it. I don't know why it puts that over top of this, but this is this is the way I would like to read it or this way, one of the two, move it up this way. I have some very old school data modeling rules that I, I need to follow, which are like a top uh, top down, left to right, typically for a three-dimensional model, but for a, a star schema, like we're all used to, I tend to use this as well, but then the top down to what's filtering. I just find it easier to read. Um, so you can see here, right, all of our dimensions. Uh, this isn't really flagged as a dimension since it's not connecting to a fact table. Uh, and then a couple of disconnected tables over here. So of course they're using that. We're not gonna work with this DAX.guide model a whole lot, or I keep saying DAX.guide because it's the website, uh, but we, it's good to know that it's there. The other thing to know is between these two tabs, now that I changed to DAX guide, you see this tab also changed to DAX guide. So these, this is synchronized. Did I change it? No, I didn't. If I changed to Contoso, now you'll see this changes to Contoso. So if you had this open in two different um, windows instead of just the one window like I have, um, and you switch from one to another, you could just peer over to your other window and, and see that. All right, well, so far we haven't really written any DAX and I promised you that we would, right? So uh, I'm gonna resize my windows a little bit here just for now. So if we uh, pull our little PowerPoint back and what we wanna do is you know, reconstruct this from the bottom up. So we're gonna ignore the order by at this point, but we have this evaluate. And you know, that's kind of curious. This is evaluating and this happens to be a variable. We'll, we'll cover more of the variables up later on, but let's just even try to produce uh, an evaluate statement um, with something like very, very simple. So for those of you that have ever learned the coding development or whatever, um, welcome to put it in the chat or come off mute and shout it out. Whenever you're learning something new, what's the first thing that you write in that language? 
Anybody? Hello world. Hello, Hello world. world. Exactly. Thanks. I needed somebody there. <laughs> so we're going to do our evaluate and we're going to try to write hello world. Now, one of the things to remember is the uh, DAX language, the DAX query, right? What we talked about must return a table. So if I just try to return a single value, I'm not going to run this, but I could tell you this is going to error. Okay. So one of the things that, that the DAX language allows us to do is use curly brackets to turn this into a table. So now this is going to be a one row, one column table that will hopefully come back and say, hello world. And you can see they have all kinds of color coding, syntax highlighting. Um, you know, so it's really nice to help you kind of find things. Now, this the other thing that we've learned uh, from listening to the to the SQL BI guys, and um, I don't know if it was Alberto or Marco that say this, but no DAX code is good DAX code unless it's formatted. So of course they give us the format, and you can see we got a whole lot more things on our toolbar expanded now. So we'll go ahead and format. It doesn't changes it just a little bit, but it's the same DAX formatter. Uh, that a lot of the tools use and that um, I think they actually provided us this as well. Uh, just to kind of cover some more of what's on the toolbar, there's a share option that we'll cover here in just a second. There's an undo. And if I um, had something to redo, I'd have the redo buffer as well. I could copy, paste, clear all. Uh, this is nice. You could highlight things and then comment it out or com yeah, comment it so that you turn it into a comment or uncomment, format recovered, run and then run line, okay? So now we expect this to work and we're just gonna do our first, first run and resize our window a little bit. And sure enough, there's our table. So the results you see come down into this bottom, uh, bottom middle pane. And it automatically formats. It has this auto format. You could turn it on or off, or you could turn it off um, uh, the auto size if you want. Again, I don't see a, a reason to do that. If you have numeric values, um, most of the time you want to look at a table. But if you want, you could produce a simple column chart or a line chart or everybody's favorite, a pie chart. So, um, oh, so it's Alberto's mantra. Yeah. It, if it isn't formatted, it isn't DAX. Thanks, Ed. Um, okay, everybody, what's the what's the only true pie chart in the world? A pizza. It's a real time pie chart telling you how much pie is left. Isn't that the only time to really use it? We'll just let that sit and see if anybody likes it. Bad dad jokes as I go on through here, so they get worse if you don't stop me. <laughs> um, and then uh, down at the bottom, you will also see um, your query history of what you did run. So right now we just have the one, but that's, that's kind of nice to go back through as well. All right, so we, we, uh, we, we successfully ran our first DAX query, and I'm going to show you the share function now because I'm going to share this with you. So if you want to save this code and share it out, uh, they'll tell you, they, they allow you to do that. So you just click save and they give you a public link, which I'm going to copy and I'll put it back in, in the link. This is the exact one that I just ran. The earlier link is ones, uh, it's my cheat sheet for the exercises I'm going to go through. So you, this is the one you would share with others. This is the one you would probably take and like bookmark for yourself because you could come back and edit it later. So if you want, if you have examples um, in your company or with your friends or whoever that you want to utilize this with um, and kind of share it, say, hey, this is a good technique for doing something. You could build out a, a, a little library to do that off of this data model and, and they could easily look at it in their browser at any time. Uh, there was just, uh, a, a while ago, and I want to say, I can't remember who started it, but um, 
it was either on Marco's or Alberto's. Um, and we, we were going through a Twitter conversation with something about DAX and we ended up using DAX.do to build out the syntax and, and embed it. You got, you could get with embed codes and use this within Twitter or just put the link in with Twitter. And it was a way to easily communicate to them what, what some, whoever put the question out there was thinking about. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a great resource for, for having those type of conversations with, with others, or like I said, building it out within your team or, you know, sitting at a bar when we go back to bars and you have a, a DAX bet with somebody and you can write it on your phone, share them the link and win the, the drink, right? Um, all right, so a little bit now that, that we know about it. So let's look back at our presentation. And so we know what Evaluate is doing. It's just, it's, it's there to run this query. This query happens to be part of a, of a variable that um, is the top N. And so let's say, you know, we don't know anything about top N at all. So let's see if we could find a way that we could kind of kind of mess with it. Well, one way, and I should have showed this earlier, is we could come in on here and we will say preview data. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this line. And you see that preview data gives us a, a top end. Well, we're, we're getting a little bit closer now. Now we, we at least have it written here for us. This is where the next window or the next pane comes in. If I click on a function uh, within my, my query window, see, and they, they didn't even format it for us. Um, it will come back with the information from DAX guide about this, this function. So, okay, well, we want to figure out how to write top end. So we could see the first value, the end value is the number of rows to return. So that's first, oh, well, it wants to return 10 rows. Sure enough, if we look down at the bottom here, uh, we could see 10 rows was returned and we see them here in our bottom grid. Okay, great. The second function is the table. Okay, well, that's the minimum that we have to give it. These two are required parameters because they're not bracketed off. So this was the minimum and so it gave Customers as the table gave us 10 rows from the table. Then you could put an order by this um, expression on, uh, tell it the order to be ascending, descending, and that's repeatable all the way through. So, um, so great. Now we understand the syntax, but wait, there's a, even a little bit more, right? So it tells us it returns a table. And then all of those great articles from SQL BI are linked onto their, their functions. And this is what I've been alluding to, DAX guide. So if we click on that, it'll open up in another tab. And this gives us a much bigger um, article on how to work with, with top end. And I'm gonna tell it to allow these cookies. And then another thing that they've been doing, um, and I think they, they had a big push on this last year, and I, th I think they're almost done with it, but they've been putting out small videos that are just like a couple minutes long about each function. So if you follow their, their YouTube channel, um, they were into like a lot of like log and um, sign and a couple other like obscure functions recently that I haven't even watched the videos. I just seen them come out. They've covered all the major ones for sure. So you come here, you could watch a video if you want to, if that's how you learn better about it. You could read some more on it. Again, uh, we, we already covered what these two things are. This is an iterator um, and it's gonna hit row context in here. So that you could even click more to find out what that means. Again, the return type is a table. They give you some remarks and then they give you an example. And so they show you what the code looks like and you could copy it. They show you what the result set is, but you could try it. Now, when we try it, guess where we're gonna go back to? DAX.do. This is where their other database comes into play for DAX guide. So um, all of their articles, or at least all of their articles on functions, definitely 
uh, use this as a data source. What I have found is the majority of the other articles that they write uh, also use these databases and you can mess with their code up here without having to try to stand up your own Power BI, uh, your PBIX file or get the download from them. If the one article that didn't use it, I know he called out early on that it didn't use their typical one. They did some other changes to it. There was one recently, um, a, a, two of them that were talking about different ways to do many, many to many's and you couldn't do that, that article here. So you'll typically find that um, they'll let you know, but it's good to, to know that, uh, that you could do a lot of what they're, they're showing. So we have our, our three rows. This is great, right? So, um, hang on, I wanna get back to my screen here because I wanna make sure I, I'm hitting this in the right order. So the way that, that I like to learn, right, is to start kind of changing a few things up. So if we come in here and we say, you know, this gives us the, the top three rows and the reason that we have that we get it by the top is this sort order. This order by is associated with the evaluate where this sorting is associated within the top end, right? Because it's in, within these parentheses. So let's say I wanna get the bottom three. Um, and I know this is, again, let me bring my little help, my cheat sheet up over here, right? So this is the number to get. This whole function is the table part of it, the, the um, second parameter to top end. And then this is the column to order by, and then this is the order. So I'm thinking to get the bottom three, I just need to change this to ascending. And of course it gives us um, help by prompting us what we need to write, which is extremely nice. It's kind of like IntelliSense. They can't call it IntelliSense because somebody we all know owns a, a trademark on IntelliSense. So I think they call it uh, autocomplete or something like that. That's why you hear that in some of the other tools also. All right, so I'm just gonna tell it sort the other way. And if that works for me, I should, I'm already learning that, hey, I just gotta make one simple change to get everything. I kind of alluded that it may or may not work. I don't see any comments in the chat of what people think, but uh, if we look at this, look, we got 282 rows come back and they all have blanks. Well, why is that? I only asked for three. The reason being, and if we went through their articles, what we would learn is that the top end function returns ties. And so that's why we're getting all of these rows. Well, that's not really what, what we want, right? So, um, you know, what, what do we want to do? How, how would we, we, you know, change this out? What's, what's maybe another thing that we could look at? Well, to deconstruct this first off, I know this is the table, right? So what you saw earlier when I had um, a query up there and then uh, I told it to do a preview of, of the data is I could put multiple evaluates within one window. So I'm gonna tell it evaluate again. And I wanna see what is returned. Uh-oh. I'm hoping that doesn't start blinking all the time now. Sometimes my Zoom does that, so hopefully we'll be okay. Um, so what I could do is do an evaluate block here and I could do another evaluate and it's just gonna run both sets of queries. I'm gonna go ahead and do my format and I'm gonna tell it to run the whole thing. And what you see down here at the bottom is tab one is what was returned by this first query. So this add columns. And again, we can look over here to see what add columns is doing. 
Uh, add columns takes in a table. Page down a little bit for you. It takes in a table. So the table that it's producing is values of product name. And then it's going to iterate through that table. And for each row on that table, it's going to add the sales amount. Sales amounts a measure. And we know this because of the naming standards that the SQL BI guys use. Um, okay, Juan, I just saw your, your other question. I will cover that here in just a second of the second order by. Um, so uh, the naming standards that SQL BI recommends is when you're adding a, we'll call it a, a temporary virtual column is to put an at sign in front of the name. And the very first link that had my combination of links, I have the article in there that they talk to why this uh, is important so that you know what comes from the data model and what actually comes from your query. And it, they provide a good example with a long query at the end to show, you know, in fact, it's a measure, but you could see exactly what was coming from the model, what was calculated earlier, um, and, and things like that. Uh, we also know that this is coming from the model because it's prefixed with the table. And that's another good best practice is measures do not have the table name in front of them where columns do have a, the table name in front of them. And if you follow that convention, uh, especially if you're gonna share out somewhere or ask, um, if, ask for help, say on Twitter, or to even you know the SQL BI guys or whatever they would um, people will be able to much easier read your your DAX if you follow these conventions. Um, and I think there was a group today. A couple of us were trying to help somebody out that put a question up on Twitter. I think we got them further. So you know it, it definitely does happen. Um, okay, so this is what what this looks like. And if we page through, we could see we're getting values, but we are getting the blanks. So our our top end function is definitely returning all of these blanks here. Now to cover um, uh, Juan's question here, uh, why are there two order by statements, right? So this order by is within the, the top end and it's telling the top end to use, use this column, sort it either ascending or, or descending in order to to rank out basically what the top three are. Um, and then this order by is for the final, the, the table that is returned by this query will then be ordered by this statement. And I could put anything else in here. I could put um, not a, a, anything that's included in the query. I could have easily ordered this by product, product name instead of sales amount, and it would not, impact the functionality. And let me just kind of do that here since the question came up, because that's what I like is to do different things in each presentation. Okay, so I could, I could put this here now and it's a little bit less confusing and I'm gonna go ahead and run it. Query one, query two, and you could see um, that doesn't show a whole lot more here because these are all blank, but you could see that they're all sorted now. All right, but let's, um, so now we're, we're still saying we wanna fix this. So it, hopefully we know a little bit around DAX and we've probably seen the filter function before. Um, and so, you know, let's go ahead and, uh, and try our filter function around here. Oh, this is not good. Hopefully that won't happen a whole lot. Because whenever it happens, I feel like I have my only way to fix it is to reboot my machine. And I would not want to have to do that today. Um, so we're going to filter around our add columns, which ends there. And we're going to get our parentheses in here. And we're going to say, comma, um, at sales amount. And so we wanna say that it is not blank. So there's a couple of ways where we could do that. I'm gonna start by wrapping it around an is blank function. 
add another parenthesis to close everything off correctly. Um, so now it would only keep the ones that are blank. And we could probably, it might've been easier if I would have done this up here. Actually, let me go ahead and move it up here real quick because it would be easier to see. Um, I'm gonna use my comment stuff to comment all of this out. See, that was a good use case for that. So let's get our table first up here. I'm gonna say filter, comma, is blank and bracket at sales amount. So if we run this now, make sure I think, I think I'm still missing a parenthesis. And let me show you something while, while I'm doing that. I think this is gonna work right, but if I do format right now, nope, see, I am still missing something uh, because you had this big red box come up that is all scary, but all that means is you, you have some type of syntax error. And I'm missing another parenthesis around format. So don't let this, this scare you off. I don't know why the message is so long. Um, and it doesn't point you real well. Hopefully we could fight through this. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so it, once you do, once it does format correctly, that goes away. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see this is keeping all of the blanks. So there's a function we could use called not, and it's gonna reverse that. And again, if we hover over top of this, we get our, it changes false to true and true to false. So let's go ahead and run this. Now we can see we have a table without any blanks in it. And that's really what we wanna start with before we do the top N to try to find the least number, right? So let's go ahead and unformat this. And we're gonna replace this whole part, or I'm sorry, this whole part, I think is what it is. We'll see if we get our scary red box. We didn't. Um, so that brought us back to the top. So now we should have this table. We'll get three of them ascending and we're gonna sort it differently now on product name. So let's go ahead and run that and see what comes out. That's the first one. Remember we got two evaluates here and voila, we got the second one. Now, most of the time you would wanna sort this um, by your sales amount and probably make that ascending as well, right? So we'll just copy this down. But you can see how the, the order buys, right, are at a different level for lack of a better term, right? This is at what our overall query returned. This is an order buy within this function. And that's why it looks a little bit funny. Okay, so now you can see we have it in, in that order. So I see there's some activity in the chat. Uh, worked it. Yeah, um, Ed just kind of reconfirming the naming standard. But yeah, I, I had somebody do that as well. Um, and, and actually they left it off and then I, and they didn't really know the standard. I said, well, I'm assuming you left off the table because this is a measure and sure enough it was because uh, they were assuming something was um, summing a something when, it, when they said, I didn't tell it to sum, so yes, you did, you used this measure. All right, so John's question, when is it best to use calculate table instead of filter? Boy, that, that's a, a good question, John. It's a little bit hard for me to answer because I don't know if there's a best, yeah, it depends. 
I didn't want to have to put a dollar in the jar. Um, I, I allow myself three at the pens a day. Um, if, if anybody knows the dollar in the jar, the guy in the cube, uh, Patrick, is now putting a dollar in the jar for every time on the live stream, they say it depends. So, um, but some of it is personal preference. Um, some of it is where I tend to fall, even that day, if I'm writing a lot of calculates, then I find that I take myself and I write calculate table next. Um, it all, might also be that you go to calculate table when you want to follow the same rules that calculate covers, because that's it, it definitely is, right? And if you go through your, your um, book, there's an order of how things get applied by the calculate function. I think there's like five high level rules of what it does. Right to where filter is just simply going to have that that filter wrap around it. Now that they also added some better syntax within filter, um, now they added the better syntax within calculate. Some people I saw would like filter a little bit better because they could build with the logical and the logical ors a bigger statement, um, and it worked well. Um, I think calculate table a lot of times will perform better. But it, it may not, you may have to iterate through like filter it is an iterator. Um, let's click on filter here, right? And, you know, it, it tells us a little bit more of what it's doing. But if we look at um, the guide, it is an iterator, right? And if we search here in calculate table, don't think it's an iterator. Um, so I, I think what, you know, cause what's gonna happen is calculate table is gonna change the, um, the, the filtering context within the model, right? It's gonna override some, either add some, depending on, on what you put there and what the rules are. So now it's going to utilize those relationships in the model. So it could potentially be faster if you're doing the exact same thing with a filter uh, uh, um, function. I agree with, with that, it depends. That's always why um, following the SQL BI, their, their best practice, right, is always write it the way that you're thinking of so you get the answer right and then work on performance. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, I was just gonna say, when you use filter, if I'm correct, you can only filter by columns in the table you're filtering. With calculate table, it, like you said, uses the model. So you could filter mm -hmm. sales where the year from the date table is, is 2020, for example. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, it's like calculate. Calculate can use multiple things. Uh, from different tables. So that's kind of where I break, where I, if I need to go outside the table, that's kind of where I use calculate table. That, that's probably, yeah, that, that's an excellent rule of thumb. Um, because I think you could do it within, um, within filter, but I think you might have to use relate it as well. Yeah. Um, and then you start getting, well, which side of the one to many relationship am I on? Do I use related or do I use related mm -hmm. table? And uh, I agree. Once you kind of get to that, it's definitely easier to go to calculate table. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, and Juan said, yeah, um, you could use filter plus related. I I, I have, right? And it, it does work. Um, but if you're trying to change it, I've never really used related table. I think just my head explodes a little bit when I have to think through that one. And I, I punt back over to calculate table. Great question. All right, so uh, so we got through this. We understand top end a little, a lot better now, right? So that knocks out this part of it. We could tell that this query is doing a top end, and it's for whatever reason, one thousand one. It's using a variable table from that comes from this query, and it's going to use calendar month and um, or calendar month number and calendar month. Um, so let's go ahead and write that, we are going to come back here, we're going to clear, and we'll use our Contoso, right? Because our end goal is we're trying to rebuild this query that we got out of 
out of Power BI. So top N, and we're going to just pick a table uh, to start with now. Let me think of how I did this in the past. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that. We'll, we'll come back to this part. Um, let's clear back up because we, we know top N, but what is important is we need to now learn, right? Because we're just going to take whatever table we could get from summarize and do a top N on it. Okay, great. So let's, let's work with summarize columns. So you could see uh, it's using month and month number. Uh, it has a filter table, uh, a filter table that is a ver that comes from a variable that's up here and we'll cover treat as um, in a little bit. And it's getting unit price. Uh, uh, it's naming the column unit price and it's using the column of uh, sales um, order lines. Actually, this is, this, is, this is one of these funny things where we talk about a best practice not to put the table name in front of a measure, but Power BI Desktop doesn't follow that. So this total unit price was a measure in that model. And when it generates its, its code, it puts the table name in front of it. It drives me nuts. Um, all right, so let's, let's try to see what summarized column looks like. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna do evaluate and use our autocomplete summarize columns. So you get, again, it tells us what it kind of looks like, but I'd also like to click on that. We see we need a group by column name. Uh, optionally, we could, you know, we could repeat this, give filter tables, expressions and names that, that you know, just keep repeating that. So that's what this was doing. So remember we had um, calendar month and calendar month number. Anybody know why we have um, the month number with the month as I'm working on just kind of getting this up here? Any thoughts on why it includes both when it probably is only displaying month? What my guess is, is that this date month and you can see I could drag and drop because I haven't shown that before, which I think is cool. I don't know why I put that column in there. It didn't used to do that. Um, is in the model, it has that month is, oh, I see what I did. I, put, I dragged it into the wrong area. Summarize columns. There we go. I want date the month, which we could see right here is gonna be the, the uh, English month. And then uh, month number, which is here. So we'll drag that out as well, which I think is, it's, again, it's sorting by, uh, by that. So we're gonna skip the filter table, but we want to put some measure, it could be any measure, um, cause I don't think it has the same one that I had was total unit price inside here. Uh, so we're going to look at not product, but sales is probably going to have our measures on it. And if I haven't showed this before, it has icons here showing, uh, what our measures. So we could, we could, uh, pick the right one pretty easily. So we're going to pick sales amount cause that's pretty common. Okay. And we have to give it a name. That's was the parameter that was before that, right? Because um, we give it a table group by columns that we could repeat the name and the expression. So we're gonna name this per our naming standards at um, sales. And we will close that out. We'll make sure it is actually DAX code by formatting it and it formats. So we, we're pretty sure it's gonna run. And I say pretty sure I've had times where it formats and it doesn't run. Okay, so we see all of this and it looks to be a, a pretty high amount. Uh, luckily, you know, the numbers are different and everything. Um, but really, is that what, what this was asking for? And if we take this a little bit backwards, we can see we have this filter table. And again, working up, we have a variable of the filter table, which is the treat as 
And it's saying treat as 2018 as our calendar year. Okay, well, based upon the table that I've, I've seen in dax.do, I should be able to just recreate that. And then as we pull up treat as, we could go a little bit deeper into it. And in this case, we're gonna do the same thing they did. And we're gonna start out with our define section. So just like we have this evaluate section and we can repeat it, we have a define section. And this define allows you to produce variables or measures, or even I've seen columns, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things, but mostly you're gonna do either measures so that they're inline measures or in, in to your whole overall query that you, you're testing with or variables to help make your code either more readable or um, you know break things out. You want variables are considered a constant once they run so they don't change and sometimes you want that. Okay, so we're gonna um, use var, which is, uh, and this, that one's hard with autocomplete. Uh, you want var. The naming standard is to start, you even see on performance analyzer and keep dragging it back again. They put two underscores in front of their variable names. Um, I tend to put one. And so I'm gonna call this year filter. And I know I spell it right when it goes back to blue because their syntax highlighting just happens to, to make it that way equals treat as, and again, it pops, pops that up. And we won't read through this a whole lot, right? But it's first we gotta have an expression and then the column name. And what this does is it's telling the, this variable to obviously treat whatever we have in the expression, which has to be um, a set of columns to be remapped and they're gonna be remapped to this column or columns. So it is possible that you could produce a set with multiples within it. We're only gonna do the one. And we want it to be, remember earlier, we had to make a set or a row, right? At basically a table uh, with our curly brackets. And we wanted it to be 2018, but I'm not sure that's what's in this model. And we'll go find that out here in just a little bit because we're gonna look down here and say in our date table, what is it that we want to utilize? So if um, we expand this out, if we look at uh, calendar year, we see the minimum value and you see it's a string. So in this case, it's CY to 2005 through uh, 2011. Uh, they do have a year number that we could choose and make it numeric. So we, let's choose that one today because that seems easier to work with. So we'll put this in here and we could see 2018, right? Is gonna be too high. I'm gonna bring it all the way down to 2005. Um, some of the things you might wanna do, especially in a model that when you're learning it and, and in this one is explore that data because it doesn't have data for every single year that it has in the calendar table. So, um, so here we go, right? We have this defined out. So now we could use this variable, which becomes a table. Uh, if we look back on summarize again, we could see we could put a filter table before our name and column expression after one of our group by columns. So we could just put that here. Remember to do our comma. And I messed something up and I know exactly where it is. I forgot to close off that bracket. All right, so we're in good shape. So remember these numbers here, right? Uh, pretty high. And now if we run it again, all right, what happened there? Oh, that came back with zero rows. Let's go to 2008. Yep, that has data. That was just a lucky guess. I, guess. I didn't even look, I should have looked over at, I have my cheat sheet over here and I didn't look to see what data I should have used, but that's okay. 
All right, so now we're getting data again. And I'll, you know, we're, we're getting really, really close to finishing this off. So here, we already have this defined. We have this exact table set up here, this filter table. We just gave it a different name, different column name. I uh, had to use a different, different number, but that's okay. So let's move our summarize here up into our defined section. And you could see, you know, right, we could just produce a new variable. And I strongly encourage you to use, um, we call it sum table, use variables. It helps with debugging and readability um, so, so much. Now here, if we wanted to, we should just be able to tell it we want some table, in this case, it happened to know it. Format, run. Okay, we're getting you know, the same thing again. We're in, we're in good shape. The last thing that we have to add, and it does it again, we know, we know how to write our top N. Um, we could do that. It's not gonna really change a whole lot here. So I don't know that we need to, but we understand what's happening here because this is just taken in this DS0 core as into the top end function. This is Power BI's way of kind of doing paging, right? If you had a whole lot more data, it, it doesn't want to bring everything back uh, if it doesn't have to. And then another query later on, it knows where it needs to go to to do its paging. So it's a performance setup. And then just like what I showed there, I just used my sum table. You could evaluate a variable that has a table in it. That's what's going to return. You could add an order by statement for the columns that are on there. And I know, cause we had a question about order by. Um, so if we look at it one way, if I say order by, and I do it in this same order that we have here. Mm. In this case, it's gonna do uh, month first, then month number which may not be really what we want, right? Because we see this returns us the alphabetical part. So that's why it put in the order by, month number first, and then month name second, and it order buys it correctly. Yay, we built this all the way out. All right, so let's take a time check. Um, I showed a little bit after 8.30. Let's see if there's questions. I got more exercises we could do that are interesting. Um, I see there was some ch chatter about uh, sorting. Uh, hopefully did that, did what I just do at the end here kind of help you with, with the sort? Oh, that was answering my question from earlier. Yep, yep, we all agree. What do you guys think? You want to go through another exercise? We can go through one a little bit quicker, or how? I don't know how late you wanna you wanna go for, or if you have some more stuff planned. I think that's a good uh, idea to go through one more exercise. Okay. Good. So let's see what I want to get to, and if you're following along, um, here's one that I want to skip up to. So it, I'm going to do three different. Um, if you if you opened up my set of tabs, uh, what I want to pull up here is if you utilize this book, like I said, a lot of the code, um, all of the code that I've worked with is in this book. So I'm going to actually be on page, starting at page 131, 132. And this is talking about uh, I think it's going to be, yeah, let me just pull these windows straight over rather than working inside my private window anymore. Okay, so in chapter five, they're, they're introducing the basics to you about uh, calculate and modifiers and everything. So remember when we talked about with um, within define, you could define your own measure. So I have a measure here that um, this is the name of it. 
And when you create a measure within this defined section, you still have to anchor it to a table. So that's why the table name is, is here. But then after you, um, that, when you use it in your query part, you do not have to reference the table. Okay, so we learned about variables. This doesn't have the right naming standards in it, um, but that's okay. So we have a variable where we're gonna get the current category sales. And I did this because, um, yeah, looking back at their book, they didn't follow their naming conventions for this within their book. So I, I pretty much wanted to copy it like that if you're looking on page, uh, I think it's 132. So um, the VAR, um, Current category sales, they're gonna get the, the measure sales amount, that value, put it into a constant. Uh, they're gonna get all sales. So they're modifying the context for the, the same measure sales amount. And they're using all, all returns all the rows in the table, ignoring any filters, but it's also, it, it's, um, it also is kind of considered a modifier. Um, there's more you could go into with this, but since this is gonna get all the columns from sales, this is gonna change the context for this measure to say, calculate this measure with all of the sales, all of the rows from the sales table. And then it does a divide of what the current category sales is, what the current amount is, divided by what was modified here to get all sales and then it returns the ratio. So here we're using our known summarized columns. We're using two columns, product category and the, cal the calendar year. And we're trying to get percent all sales. And sure enough, we're, we're doing it. And you see it's, it, it's a very, very low number in some cases. Because what this is doing with this all is we're looking at this and we're removing both of these row, this uh, row filter gets changed over to a content, to a, um, um, the, the row expression gets changed to a filter expression, but for the uh, all cells, it's, it's removing both of them. Probably what we really wanna do is compare product categories within the same year, right? Because this, this gets kind of misleading when, when we look at it without doing it this way. So that becomes of a way, you know, they, now they show us how to change that. And let me pull that window over. And this is the first way they show us how to do that. So again, we have the same setup, our measure, and what we could see is the difference here, while well, we're naming this difference, to say what the sales for the current year would be. So we still have, we're removing the filters from sales, so we're getting all the rows from sales, but we're reapplying the filter for the date year. And this was their first technique of, of doing this so that people would learn a little bit more, right? So this is, this is a valid way of doing it. It's not a common way that people do this. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I held the book up uh, real quick. I see somebody was asking. It's the definitive guide to DAX. Hopefully, there you go, that looks better. Take the glares off of it and everything. Uh, a lot of people call that, call this book the DAX Bible. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a little bit more of an advanced read. Um, if you're trying to go, sure, no problem. If you're trying to go from something like SQL to DAX, um, a lot of people say Phil Seamark's book really helps you with that a whole lot better. Um, but there's a lot of good books out there for, for learning DAX. Uh, there's a lot of good um, meetups and, and presenters on it. So, you know, look for that. Um, Okay, so let's see. So now we're calculating all sales just for the current year by reapplying the years that are um, within the model. So now we could see we get a, a, let's jump back, right? You see the first one was a very low percentage, 0.34%. 
see the second one comes up to almost 1%. And so now what this is doing is this is comparing my categories across just this current year. So when I'm looking at all of 2007, this is all the same for 2007, where the first one was, again, you know, being having the, this, the uh, second value, the divider being uh, calculated for every single year. And that's why it's so much lower. Okay, so um, those are the, the first two things that they talk about in the book. And, and again, I bring this up because when I first went through this book and I was reading it, I, you know, I knew I could download their data models and pull them up. And I did a little bit, but I found it to be just a little bit of a hassle. And so what I'm hoping people will think about is if you come in here and you see something that you want to test, this will make it easier by using dax.do to just come in and type it in and, and put it in. And I think for myself, I learn better when I'm actually typing and I'm, and I'm actually doing it. So, um, you know, that, that was the point that I wanted to make. But at the top of the page, of page 133, sorry, um, they talk about a whole nother setup and it's using modifiers. And uh, instead of me risking messing this up, let me make sure I get this right. Yep. So let me just pull this window over because that's the easier way. And they say, we'll show you how to do this easier at the top of that, that page with all selected. And this is the more common way people write it, right? They're gonna use all selected. And I'm gonna give you one more after this because there's something even more, a little bit better since this book was written. Um, so it, it'll tell you what, um, what's going on, uh, returns all the rows in a table or all the values in a column, ignoring any filters that have been applied, but keeping filters that come from outside. And it sounds a little bit complicated, but you could see what we're doing here is we're reapplying the values um, for date, calendar, year. And here we're saying all select it, but we're going to return all the rows, um, sorry, all selected product category. So we're gonna keep what's selected for product category and we're gonna do all for the other column that's in here. Sorry, I got that reversed again. This is, this is why I always kind of reverse it. Um, it, it, this one stumps me. So I'll select it. It's going to keep the filter for the year, the date calendar year, and remove the filter for product category. And if we run that, we see we're getting the 0.91. The 0.91, we're getting the same answer. But since that book was written, what has come out is remove filters, which to me, Again, just reading it reads a whole lot better. Um, don't think I want those double here. So let's get rid of this. Get rid of this, make sure it all still. And if I'm correct, which I hope I am, we will format. I got something wrong. What did I have wrong here? Oh, we need a... Um, for our calculate, okay, and run, and we get the same value and it reads even easier. So what this is saying now is remove filters for product category, which means it's gonna keep um, the, the filter for year. Hopefully that I didn't confuse people a whole lot. I like how this reads a whole lot better. Um, like I said, I don't think, it, maybe it is in the book in the later part of the book, um, but this to me is a much better example. And so you could see, right? My point again is use, you know, you could get this for the book. Um, you may or may not consider this to be right. If you wanna know your percent against all years, all sales, great. This is one way of doing it. This is more common, um, but this is not the common way to write it the all selected or remove filters is probably the better way. Um, so a couple of things in the comments. 
is there a performance improvement with remove filters versus all selected? I don't believe so. I believe um, kind of like uh, what is said below that, it's better reading. I fully agree with that. I, I could read it a whole lot better. You could see I even struggled when I, and I, I've even used it, right? And I still struggle when I'm trying to read it and reverse in my head what it's trying to say. Um, this may even be what they call um, syntax sugar on top of all selected. Uh, there might be a couple performance improvements because it is a newer function. And when they do newer things, they improve the performance. So that was real quick through, through another example. Um, I have other links out there that you guys can go through on, out on your own. Um, the one that I did kind of skip over uh, was about uh, add columns versus summarize. And um, that has a little bit of a good example around um, the, the context transition. And so if you want to work through that, and I'll show it real quick. We won't have to walk through it. But there's, there's um, two evaluates in here, and it shows you the difference of what happens with summarize versus um, add columns, which is also is used with, uh, this is summarize columns, add columns is used with summarize a lot. And there's uh, what you'll see is if I pull up the result set for one, I'm getting different results for all three measures. And it, it's trying to do the exact same thing. It's just here, I'm writing sum and I'm writing the expression here. Here I'm using the measure that I have up top. And here I have the same expression that I have on line nine, just wrapped in a calculate. You see the last two give to me what looks to be the, la the correct value where the first one just gives me the same value all the way through because the context transition didn't occur here. To where summarize columns, if I go to tab two, it gives me the right answer all the time uh, because it, handles context transition differently. And so that's something to, when you're looking at different functions, DAX function and testing with them, that's something to kind of think about. If you're not, if you're running something and you're not getting the right answer or the answer you expect, and you're especially if you're getting the same answer in every row, you probably need to wrap it with a calculate like this example shows. Let me see. Can we load our own data? Um, no, no, you cannot. Um, this is the SQL BI. Uh, it's their infrastructure, but like uh, Ed stated, use uh, DAX Studio. You could do all the same things, except you don't get these little help, um, you know, like the, the link to DAX guide and stuff like that. But you could do it all against your model with DAX Studio. And then what I tend to do is if I got to remember something about a, um, a function, I'll take the copy of the function and just go to DAX guide and do the search and find it. Uh, but you could run the multiple evaluates, the define section. All of this is really what a query looks like. And it's really what Power BI is generating for you for every visual behind the scenes. And again, so trying to get to know it a little bit better, you'll, you'll get to, I think I've become a better developer of measures the more I learn about how to write queries and, and to write them efficiently. And some paginated reports that I had to write, I have one that I think I have 200 lines of code the way I have to merge all these things together that was performing horribly within a Power BI data set. But I wrote the DAX code against the same Power BI data set um, to build the table and I got great performance out of it in a paginated report. Plus I, they wanted a lot more rows that would come out and make it export um, export to Excel, which we all love. There was a valid reason for this. Um, they were scheduling all these meetings and I, I built um, a line where I concatenated all the, the meeting participants together so they could see the date of the meeting, the time of the meeting, pull all those people and just paste it into their Outlook 2 line and boom, all of the, the people were, were on the invite. So it was actually a good use for exporting out to Excel. I don't see any other questions in the chat. If anybody wants to come off mute, ask questions, have a conversation or anything, more than welcome to.
I know I went through the last few things pretty quickly. I'm trying to leave a little bit of time here, but. Will anybody has any final questions for Kevin? This is Ed. I don't have a question so much, Kevin, as if you go back to the very first example you did where you were doing the top end and you removed the, uh, you excluded the blanks. Mm -hmm. You did something there that was really subtle that I don't know if people appreciate. You did not use uh, this measure uh, does not equal blank. You use not is blank. Yeah, I don't know that I have that window. Oh, that was in my private window. Let's see. Could yeah, it was real early in the process. Uh, I should have brought it up back then, and then I didn't think about it. Uh, I I use the function of not. Right, and then is blank, and mm -hmm. the reason I wanted to kind of point that out to people when I first started writing queries, I would say sales amount is unequal to the blank function, mm -hmm. and that is not the same thing. And it took me about half an hour to figure out that if you say it's not equal to blank, it also mm -hmm. excludes zeros. Mm -hmm. And what, what Kevin's done here is the correct way to do it. So maybe that'll save somebody a, a, a fit of excluding too much. Yeah, good good point. Yeah, and and sometimes, right, we, we kind of get into our habits and we forget others don't know it. And, um, but I'll, if, if I give this again, I'll remember to point that out as well. That's a good good hint. Um, there's a question where this last sample comes from. Um, do you want to come off mute? Maybe I, I'm not sure I understand the question a whole lot. The, the sample, the data set comes from, from the SQL BI guys themselves. Um, there's ways that you could download this Contoso. And obviously if, if um, like if you have their book and they tell you what to download, I think almost any article that they have a download is going to be their um, smaller Contoso database and um, in a Power BI PBIX file, PBIX file. Um, and, and you could go ahead and use it. You could take that and put it up on a, a service and you know do a, uh, a live connection to it. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's, their, uh, it's their version for Contoso and they, they make it easily available. Any, Any further questions for Kevin? Okay, I think that's about it. Thank you very much, Kevin. Much appreciated uh, for no, your time. Uh, no problem. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, if you have questions later, um, you know, the easiest way is connect with me on Twitter at Kev Arnold. Um, um, you know, I never mind interruptions. So. It's something that as, uh, as my data sets are building and I'm, uh, or, or I'm testing something, then I, I don't mind answering things. All right. Thanks, Kevin, again. Thanks, everyone, for attending. I'll uh, make the recording available in the next day or so. OK. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.